Hey folks! Now riddles today. The hero of this video is an incredible musician, producer, author, singer, director, photographer, writer, philosopher, activist, pacifist, vegan, and animal rights activist, whom we all know as Moby. But I'm just wondering, when you hear this name, what is the first thing that comes up to your mind? Well, except that he's a bald man wearing glasses. Movie soundtracks. Perhaps music from a commercial. Or just your favorite music videos with this famous cartoon character. Yes, before you have watched this video, I'm really wondering. Write in the comments below the video what Moby means to you. Probably for most people, Moby's music is very delicate, intelligent, slightly thoughtful electronic music with a touch of blues and light sadness. Something like that. And no wonder, the main album of his career, Play, gave us all this. But what if I told you that this is also Moby? And this is Moby. And yes, this is him too. His works know no boundaries. The range of genres amazes. His way of thinking arouses great interest and his hits are still soul-soothing. Today we will try to tell you about one of the most influential artists in the history of electronic music and music in general. About a loser who, at the age of 34, decided to give up music forever and record a farewell album and about the legend who changed music with this album and recorded another dozen and a half after that. Let's take a look at his wider road to success, study different facets of his works and, of course, make a detailed analysis of the secrets of making his major hits. If you like this video, give it a thumb up, check if you're subscribed to Long Play, and let's go! Well, if you try to evaluate the popularity of Moby's albums using a chart, it would look something like this. Which does not mean that these albums are not good enough, but let's just say that there was an obvious peak in Moby's career, an obvious culmination, and it was the album called Play. Indeed most of his hit songs are collected in this album. And today we will emphasize them in a little more detail from time to time. But let us start with one important detail. At present, Play is, dare I say it, an iconic album. But back then, in 1999, when it had just been released, it did not become popular. Moreover, many critics completely destroyed it. I'll definitely tell you a little later what happened and why everything changed. But for now, let's turn to one quote. This quote is from an article in the LA Weekly newspaper, where the author goes, there is a song on this album that puts a question. Why does my heart feel so bad? And I know why. The article author goes on. Because I listen to this album. Why does my heart... So, the first reviews were something like this one. And now, let's focus precisely on this. One of the most popular, one of the greatest, and one of the most beautiful Moby songs. 
First of all, let's move from Moby to some older guys. In this case, the Banks brothers. When I should feel... This is a gospel religious chant. This recording was made in 1966. So very sad. Can you hear those yes, yes in the background? Well, you may wonder why the singer feels so very sad. Why does my heart... As you can see, he's also wondering. Well, what interests us is that this is a sample from Moby's song, Why Does My Heart? A 1966 gospel song by the Banks Brothers. Why does my heart... Behind the success, behind the popularity of our hero, of course, there is a vast number of nameless voices. So, let's pay respect to some of them. So Let me read a short excerpt from Moby's interview. With the older records, most of which were just live recordings, you get the quality of a room it was recorded in. I've learned to pray. It's a ghostly presence. Also, you can take the original vocals, which is very neutral, and change the chords, making it a different character. Open door. Let me try to demonstrate clearly what he meant. Moby matched the chords from this song to the clean voice from the original sample. Why does my heart feel so bad? But he could just as well choose completely different chords, changing the mood of the song, changing the character of the person singing, even though nothing would have to be changed in the vocals. Well, let's say, why does my heart feel so bad? I sang the same line, nothing changed, but with a different chord, it sounded, well, sweeter, I would say. This is what is called harmonization. Why does my heart... It's due to the harmonization of samples that many of Moby's major hits were created. Why does my soul... He's singing, why does my heart feel so bad? Why does my soul? What do you think comes next? Feel so happy. Feel so happy. Moby made a slight change in meaning here. Feel so and this is such an important feature of his style, rather the style of his major hits. Similar work with isolated voice tracks, and yes, he did not reinvent the wheel here. And he was not the first to resort to this technique. Many before him were using isolated voice tracks. But nobody had ever done it the way Moby did it on the Play album. Or if somebody had, those songs were far behind Moby's experiments in terms of popularity. Most DJs previously used the voices of disco and soul singers. And at some point, of course, it all became more hackneyed. The distinctive feature of isolated voices Moby used is that those tracks are taken from gospel and blues. And we will delve into this later on today. Also today we will be looking at Moby's 2009 interview about the Play album, where he comments on all of the songs. And here's what he said about this song. Why Does My Heart was written in 92, which is seven years before the release, as a really bad techno song. I found this record. It's called These Open Doors. Here it is. At some point, I rediscovered this song and I tried doing a considerably slower try to make it mournful and romantic. 
Eventually, his manager Eric persuaded Moby to include the song on the album, and it turned out to be a massive hit. A little later, we'll talk about how Moby came up with this super original idea of working specifically with old blues voice tracks, as well as about other songs from this iconic album in general. But now, let's go back in history. Richard Melville Hall, also known as Moby, was born in New York in September 1965. The New York of the 70s during Moby's childhood and youth, it was actually some sort of a mixture of the peak of a disco era with emergence of punk, hip-hop, electronic music. Just an amazing melting pot, which perhaps has never happened in the history of music. And obviously, this context played its role in Moby's formation um, as a musician. And as for the stage name, Moby, his father began calling him that three days after his birth. Richard was too long for him to pronounce. But why Moby? It's an homage to the whale from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Why the whale? Let's not forget that Moby's name is Richard Melville. And he's actually the great, great, great nephew of Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick a classic of American literature. Let's give a nice welcome to Moby. Unfortunately, when Moby was just two years old, his father died in a car accident. As a result, our hero was raised either by his mother, a party girl with mental health issues, or by his grandmother. Spending his childhood for the most part as a poor little outcast living in a wealthy suburb of New York. However, his mother was progressive and supportive in all his endeavors. His teachers, most of whom belonged to the hippie generation, also nurtured and encouraged creativity and independent thinking in him. Therefore, our hero defeated all his problems with the help of music. Moby started making music at the age of nine. He first began learning to play both guitar and piano, he studied theory, jazz, and percussion instruments. Later, this would gradually emerge in his work. Without mastering any instrument, he would be able to create music using any of them, music of any genre. And yes, Moby started in 1983 playing drums and guitar in various punk bands. Such as Vatican Commandos. I'm sure it's familiar to many fans of hardcore punk. Later, Richard put together an interesting post-punk project, A Wall. where he performed under the new stage name, Moby Hall. And in 1984, he dropped out of college and, tired of the guitar and drums, began to get involved in electronic music in search of new interesting sounds. But success was still too far away. Moby DJed in nightclubs and lived in an abandoned factory building without even running water or heating. This was my home for three years. But it had electricity supply, which was all he needed to record his music. You, 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 you. Which he then would send to labels, receiving refusal after refusal. In 1989, after five years in an abandoned factory, Moby moved to New York, where he continued performing as a DJ at nights, selling records during the day and, at the same time, playing alternative guitar rock music. Another band, Ultra Vivid Scene. You can even see a young Moby in its 1989 music video. As you can see, before starting his solo career, our hero was tossed around in all directions. But by that time, he'd become a popular DJ. Yeah! 
whose sets have already attracted people all over America. Moby signed his first long-awaited contract with the independent label Instinct Records only in 1990, releasing his debut single Mobility there. Actually, it could hardly be called a label, because the studio was equipped by Moby in the apartment of the label owner. Moby himself sometimes answered the calls, and he was basically the only artist there. Voodoo Child, Barracuda, Brainstorm. All these are the names of different projects under which Moby's early records were released. To make it easier to distribute them all, and to make it seem like the label had some other artists signed. But, surprise, surprise, the first real breakthrough awaited him under his main name. On that same debut record, the track Go was placed as a B-side. This record didn't achieve anything special. Perhaps it was missing something. What exactly? Moby realized when he was watching another episode of his favorite TV show, Twin Peaks. Moby fell in love with Twin Peaks from the very first episode he saw on TV and fell in love with one of the themes written by Angelo Badalamenti. And he decided to add it to his track. He made it two tones higher, played some synthesizers on top of it and added samples. And the result was a version that began to spread across electronic dance floors, especially in the UK. After some time, Moby received a letter from David Lynch himself. Hi, it goes. I recently heard this record. Sorry, but we're suing you. Which is quite logical. How do you think it all ended? And this incident greatly describes Moby's sincerity. He replied to Lynch. Look, I really like your show. I would be very grateful if you would not sue me. Instead, please allow me to use this theme. And a couple of days later, Lynch replied. Okay, use it, do what you want. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. And since then, Moby and David Lynch are great friends who have collaborated together several times. And if you've watched it, you know, but if you haven't, I recommend watching the documentary Moby Doc, where Lynch is also a character, one of the interviewers. Do we have a beat? Moby, did you uh, work with Dean on a beat? Well, I can't help but pay attention to an important detail, this string pad. Which Moby borrowed from the Twin Peaks theme. Seems to me that this is also an important feature of the future Moby, that Moby beloved by the masses. We'll come back to this later, but for now, let's continue. With the success of the single Go, Moby became very popular in the electronic music scene, especially in the UK. But even before the release of his debut album, he had a fight with a label, which didn't want to let him go to larger competitors. And eventually, Moby's debut album, in the wake of his success, was released by the Instinct label independently. They just collected his unreleased demo recordings there. Essentially, it was a compilation, not a creative canvas. However, riding the wave of success of Go, our hero toured a lot, both solo and as an opening act. For example, he opened for no less than The Prodigy. The early 90s Moby was extremely experimental and increasingly hard techno. The track Thousand, for example, was recognized by the Guinness Book of Records 
is the fastest, with a speed of 1015 BPM. Having released another album on the Instinct label, Moby finally managed to leave it after many arguments, lawsuits and a compensation of $10,000. Then he went on to the US market with a major label Elektra, while simultaneously signing to the European Mute label owned by Daniel Miller, a label well known to all Depeche Mode fans. The result was not long in coming. The track Move hit number one in the Billboard Dance Music chart. And Moby himself could finally experiment more with his music. For example, with All That I Need Is To Be Loved. In addition to the classic ace and bass, he added his own vocals to the song for the first time. And then this song would be included in the next album as some kind of mixture of electronics, hardcore punk and thrash metal. Yeah, that's what I was talking about at the very beginning. That's Moby. In his future works, he would continue to juggle genres, moving from dance music to rock and even industrial, then return into ambient and so on. Basically, laying such a conceptual foundation in what would later become not so eclectic and well-known Sound of Moby. The result of all these experiments was the 1995 album Everything is Wrong. And even though its commercial success is not comparable to what awaited our hero later, this album was a huge step in his career. From dance pop and breakbeat to an ambient mixed with industrial. And all these ends with the most wonderful bewitching ballad When It's Cold, I'd Like to Die with Hugo Largo's vocalist Mimi Gacy. Spin magazine named Everything is Wrong the album of the year. Many critics said that this album was ahead of its time. Billboard proclaimed Moby the king of techno. This is my dream. And the Los Angeles Times wrote, I'll quote, 29-year-old Moby is ready for greatness, to finally make that big crossover from respected underground artist to mainstream electronic and rock musician. As you can imagine, it turned out to be right. But there's a catch. It was 1996. Moby's sales were growing. All the critics, as one, insisted that this was a new superstar. What did Moby do? He released a hardcore punk album. He got tired of the whole of electronic crowd. He felt that the scene was going somewhere wrong. He decided that the media misunderstood his music and didn't take it seriously enough. And in such a long-awaited album, he began experimentally as an electronic musician to mix punk, industrial, hardcore, and even crust. Complementing all this with such gentle instrumentals. Just like in the song that opens the album, but it is followed by something much more interesting. Or take the intro to Say It's All Mine. 
behind which lies the continuation. So defiant, so not obvious, I would say. As an experiment, you can play this album to your friends just for fun. I guarantee it will be difficult to guess the artist. Or maybe your partner will want to listen to something like Moby on a romantic night. At a time when Prodigy Chemical Brothers and Fatboy Slim were smashing, he could easily climb onto the same pedestal, if not higher, taking over the whole world. But he decided it was too boring. Sometime later, in an interview, he said that, although it was a slightly dumb and career-destroying move, he had no regrets. After all, from an artistic point of view, this was exactly what he wanted to say. But of course, all this does not change the fact that the album was still a failure. And further, history shows how different human destinies may be depending on the chosen path. Despite the unsuccessful album, the still in-demand Moby goes on a European tour with the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Soundgarden. And at the same time, he performs at electronic festivals. In addition, by this time, Moby had a lot of works under his belt that became soundtracks. Scream and Joe's Apartment, Cool World and Saint all these resulted in the collection I like to score. With a fresh remix of the James Bond theme for the movie Tomorrow Never Dies. However, this was no longer the same Moby from whom everyone was expecting an incredible breakthrough. On the contrary, everyone insisted that his time had passed. James Bond. The disappointed and depressed Moby begins to seek salvation in the image of sex, drugs and rock and roll, which of course leads to nothing good. The American label Elektra terminated his contract. The media was no longer interested in him. In addition, in 1997, after a long illness, his mother passed away from lung cancer and he missed her funeral, unable to recover from a drunken blackout. It was time to record another unsuccessful album and end things all together. If not with life, then at least with music. Remember I said that a loser at 34 decided to quit music. So, after the disastrous animal rights, it was play that Moby conceived as a farewell album. Can you imagine this? And here I would like to look into the biography of a completely unexpected person, to whom Moby, I believe, owes his successful career. His name is Alan Lomax. I said, this is the greatest music. To be honest, I was going to dedicate a separate line to him in this video, but then it would have probably be a three hours long episode, so we'll keep it short. People like Alan Lomax are incredibly important in any country. In addition to writing, composing and performing music, he was collecting music. He was doing this first all over America and later all over the world. Alan Lomax is a folklorist who would get into a car, and we're talking about the middle of the 20th century, so he would get into the car, drag out into the middle of nowhere, take out a bunch of equipment and just record ordinary people. I'll tap for food fire and I'll start breaking wrong. Workers, weavers, farmers, this way, Alan Lomax, for example, discovered Lad Valley. My girl, my girl don't lie. Whom many of you should know well, and who became an incredibly influential blues musician. Tell me where did you sleep last night? Come on. Or another example, 
In 1941, when Alan Lomax once again went to the Mississippi Delta, he accidentally came across muddy waters. If you watched the movie Cadillac Records, then I think you should remember this episode. I'm Alan Lomax, and this is Mr. John. If you know nothing about this, Muddy Waters is the father of everything in modern music. Well, to be more precise, he was originally the father of the Chicago blues. So, in the late 90s, a collection fell into the hands of Moby. It was released in 1993 under the title Sounds of the South, a musical journey from the Georgia Sea Islands to the Mississippi. This is one of hundreds of Lomax collections of his records that he made in the South of the United States in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. This is a recording from 1959, recorded by Alan Lomax. This is Bessie Jones. The record is called Sometimes. When Bessie was already in her 50s, she met Lomax. And she herself, of course, was just happy to preserve her music, her culture, heritage, African American culture. And in the end, after all these recordings, she became quite an influential musician. Lomax himself called her the mother of the courage of the American black tradition. Let's get back to the Rolling Stone interview. My friend, music journalist Dimitri Alric, once obtained the recordings of American folklore collector Alan Lomax. My friend was not interested in this box of songs, so he gave it to me. That's where I heard these cool a cappellas. Do you get now how it worked? There is a clear voice over which Moby comes up with a piano part and drums, and then he develops it all as he wants. I wrote Honey in about 10 minutes. My then girlfriend really liked this theme, which was actually surprising since my music never really bothered her. This is why we can say thank you to Moby's girlfriend for guiding this young man who is into alternative and decided to do something unique and at the same time simple. Let's move on. Find my baby. Also recorded by Alan Lomax, 1959. It was performed by a singer nicknamed Boy Blue, also known as Roland Hayes. This performer is not that famous. Alan Lomax recorded him during a performance in some bar. So after Moby made this song, no one even knew where to look for him, where his ears were to pay them off the royalties. I read several articles about this, but I still couldn't find out if he was finally found. If anyone knows, please share in the comments. Here I play guitar over a vocal sample. Here I also added what I considered hip-hop beats at the time. And now my favorite. Field recordings by Alan Lomax again. 1937 with Vera Hall singing. This is the actual title of the record, Trouble So Hard. Moby put it on the album at the last minute because he was the only one who liked it. Everyone around, the whole team, all the managers said that it was somehow too refined, but Moby insisted and did the right thing. Vera Hall was a seamstress, the mother of a former slave 
the favorite voice of Alan Lomax, thanks to whom she also became very popular in her time. Don't nobody know my trouble but God. And also at an advanced age. If you didn't know, maybe you were wondering, as I was wondering before, what exactly Vera Hall sings. Here are the lyrics. She sings, Oh Lordy Lord. Well, we won't limit ourselves to just blues on the Play album. To be honest, the entire album consists of very interesting samples, which will take a very long time to analyze. We will focus on the most interesting ones, in our opinion. Well, first of all, of course, the greatest magnificent porcelain. This is the soundtrack to the 1960 film Exodus. Such epic horns. Let's cut them off. Add them to our already composed rhythm section of three instruments. Turn it around. And let's see what we get out of it if we'll get anything out. Let's read the story. It's funny, but this song became probably the most famous from the album. But initially, I didn't want to include it there. Because when I first recorded it, I decided that it sounded very average. I didn't like it. How sweet everything turned out, and my voice sounds very weak here. I couldn't imagine that anyone else would want to listen to it. And this is what Moby says about this song. I personally cannot ignore the song Body Rock. Because this is my youth, this is FIFA, and probably the year 2001 or something. I guess you've also heard this song in the intro millions of times. And it's completely sample based. Now, this is hip hop. Spoonie G, the pioneer, rap from the 70s. Probably one of the first artists to record rap. Body Rock was the song that both of my managers asked me to take off the album. They thought it didn't belong there. They considered it an imitation of Fatboy Slim, which probably has some truth. And I must agree with Moby here. After some time, when I hadn't heard the song for a long time, for some reason I was sure that he was actually Fatboy Slim. The guitar parts are inspired by the song What We All Want by Gang of Four. Also, putting an orchestral theme into chorus is after all Fun for a hip-hop thing, it was also funny that the greatest hit was released not on the album itself, but on the B-side. I'm talking about the song Flower. And this, as you might guess, is also a recording by Alan Lomax. And surprisingly, when the album came out, as I said earlier, no one put it on the pedestal. Plus, Moby no longer had a contract in America. He recalled how he personally sent the record to all labels from Warner to Sony, but it was rejected everywhere. And when finally the small label V2 took him over and began sending the album to journalists for promo, they simply refused to listen to it. Now we know Moby is a stadium artist, but how many people do you think came to the presentation of Play? 
1,000 or 500 maybe. 40 people came to the Virgin store in New York where Moby performed his new tracks. Add to this low radio and TV plays and you'll get a complete failure. But wait, isn't this one of the most iconic albums of the late 20th century? As I already mentioned, in previous years, Moby's works were often popular among filmmakers. Cool World, Assassins, Hackers, Scream, Heat, starring Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Looking at this success, together with his managers and labels, Moby decided to take a different path and offer quite an expansively, sometimes even for free, music from the new album for licensing in movies, commercials and TV shows. They began to literally bombard various film studios and advertising agencies with songs from the album. And it had an outcome. Gone in 60 seconds and Requiem for a Dream. Get Carter. Play to the Bone. The X Files. And at least a couple of dozens or even more than a hundred films were released with soundtracks from the Play album in 2000 and 2001 alone. Add to this a huge number of commercials. Porcelain alone could be heard in one ad block several times in a row. As for Porcelain, I can't help but highlight the Beach movie. The film, which only just after Titanic, thanks to Leo DiCaprio, attracted the attention of the whole world, where one of Moby's best creations was also very appropriate. So, thanks to licensing, movies, ads, and to be more precise, thanks to the fact that everyone involved in the release of the record, and especially Daniel Miller and the Mute label, did not give up, the Play album became what it became. It sold 12 million copies, while their wildest dream was 250,000 copies. One of Moby's managers, Eric Earle, later said, we were very lucky. Any major record label would have cancelled the campaign, but our label, Mute, continued to work on the album even 10 months after the release. It was thanks to them that everything worked out. The next album after such an incredible success was 18. And here Moby did not make it experimental to spite play, but essentially continued its line. To this day, this album is considered controversial. On the one hand, 18 occupied the first line of the UK chart, overtaking the Platinum Collection by Queen. And also, the fourth line on Billboard, ultimately selling a truly impressive 4 million copies. On the other hand, the commercial success of the Play album was much bigger, and it was impossible to get rid of comparisons. But we're still more concerned about music. Here we get into gospel music again, and this time it was not Alan Lomax who recorded it. This recording was made in 1956. Lord, don't leave me. The Davis Sisters, the gospel choir, and a super hit that was made based on the same principle. Lord, and a cherry on top, a sample from the gorgeous song Extreme Ways. In 
In the four years since the release of Play, Moby has performed more than 500 sold-out concerts. And in 2002, he even performed at the opening of the Winter Olympic Games. In 2003, Moby headlined the Glastonbury Festival. And suddenly, he made a song for Britney Spears. Just how widely popular he became can be seen through Eminem's song and iconic video, Without Me. Where Eminem thoroughly roasts Moby with a parrot. This beef is actually worth a separate review. Write in the comments below if you're interested, and we'll tell you about it someday. Apart from David Lynch, David Bowie was added to his close friends. Well, in the mid 2000s, Moby was finally a truly big mainstream star. And here, I wouldn't want to ignore this little guy. This is basically Moby's alter ego, drawn by Moby himself. He even has a name, Little Idiot. I'll read the interview again. I started drawing characters in the mid-80s, and every bag of records that came from my cash register, to clarify, Moby was working in a record store at the time, so every bag of records was painted with these cartoon tadpoles. He would sit and draw them on paper bags. First associated with Moby's work, Little Edith first appeared in 1995. He was on the cover of the single Bring Back My Happiness. And when Moby needed to somehow draw the video Why Does My Heart Feel So Bad, this wonderful character came in handy. I'm sure that each of you has the best memories associated with all these very kind, very touching videos accompanied by this wonderful music. Later, Moby began to insert the little idiot into other videos and on the covers of singles and albums. Moby even used this image as an autograph for some time. He had a mini album with the same name and even the independent label which Moby opened was called Little Idiot. And even if I'm not mistaken, that's exactly his nickname on X, formerly known as Twitter. To explain who this is firsthand, I'll read. This is a simple, modest caricature of myself in the form of a little space bug. Very cute. So, this cartoon was sort of a refuge for Moby in difficult times, which was always with him. And symbolically, when it was used in a video, it marked the beginning of success. That's how the story goes. The next 2005 album Hotel made a turn somewhere towards pop rock. It contains almost no samples, but commercially it turned out to be even less successful than the previous one. And today it is unloved even by Moby himself, although Hotel included some Really, really great hits, for example, the romantic Slipping Away, which was recorded with backing vocals by Alison Moyet from the band Yuzu, and later re released by the great Milan Fermer. And one of the favorite songs of all fans lifts me up. And here's a kind of tribute to the Sisters of Mercy band. Moby even wanted their singer 
Andrew Eldridge to sing the song. But something just didn't work out and I think it's better this way. Broken down call, broken down call. By the way, absolutely all the instruments on the record except drums were played by Moby himself. And finally, I won't leave you without a fun fact. I've always wondered, but I've only found out now, so I'm eager to share this with you. Lift me up, lift me up, higher now, Ama. That's what Moby sings in this song. And so I've been wondering what actually Ama means. Well, here Moby is singing to some fictional deity. God's names such as Buddha, Jehovah, Allah, Krishna have a common R sound, which Moby tried to imitate. In an interview he explained, I thought it would be interesting to have a word that sounded like the name of a deity, but not a specific one. At this stage, most of Moby's biography seems to end. But this does not mean that he stopped his activities, on the contrary. He became many times more active. He continued to write soundtracks, formed new side projects and released new albums one after another. The Electronic 2008 album Last Night and the beautiful, very lyrical and creative 2009 Wait For Me. Don't hurt me this way. Don't touch me. It seems this is the first album where he's already starting his new life without trying to repeat his past success. Don't hurt me again. Don't hurt me again. Don't hurt me again. Destroyed the singles from which were chosen for release by Moby fans themselves. Right to know what to all in all, after his farewell album Play, Moby has already released 16 albums. And this is only under the name Moby, not including side projects and work under other stage names. <laughs> Can the commercial result of these works even come close to Play? No. But obviously, he doesn't need this. Once, quite sincerely, he already created something that still allows him to create whatever way he wants, without regard to what will be written about it and what will be said about it. All appearances on soundtracks in one way or another allow Moby's hits to still be heard today, and he can appear on the charts without any unnecessary activities. Just as an icon figure, for example, thanks to rappers, I'm done with adjusting the thing. Pull up on your set, leave a Gang. Who sample his songs. A striking example is Porcelain and ASAP Rocky in 2018. Moreover, Mob is not just a talented and influential musician. Like a true Renaissance person, he devotes himself to dozens of occupations professions and social causes, from animal rights to climate change and environment. And I could list the charity foundations with which he interacts for literally another couple of hours. Thank you very much. Over the past 15 years, Moby has written several books, ranging from memoirs to vegan cookbooks. So because these are vegan, organic, brand pancakes, they're not going to be as big and fluffy. And photographs he took are exhibited in galleries all over the world. He said, as a photographer, shoot what you see that other people don't see. If you open the booklet of any of Moby's albums, most of them contain essays by him on various topics about overconsumption and religious leaders, about self-knowledge and many other both everyday and global issues. At the same time, even though Moby's personality, his comments and views are sometimes very contradictory, I really like how gently, you know, without trying to 
impose his views on anyone he shares all his political, religious and social activism. And this is also his great power. Answering the main question of this video, how did Moby change music? The answer seems obvious. Moby was one of the people who brought electronic music into the mainstream, into stadiums, and made it accessible to everyone. Yes, he was not the only one. We've already talked about Prodigy in this context, and we will talk about many others. But he did it in his own way, gently and very creatively. And this is the word, creatively, that I would like to highlight. Because Moby changed the concept of creativity in music for many musicians at that time. He showed how or what you can create yourself if you have desire and fresh ideas. Moby was also one of those who erased genre boundaries, focusing the listener's attention just on beautiful music. And in the end, he always stayed true to himself. Even though he was no longer as in demand as before. And he's probably much happier now than at the height of his fame. I'll do without long epilogues, as today's episode turned out to be rather long as it is. I hope this deserves your like on this video and of course a subscription to the channel so you don't miss the next one. And that's all for today. Take care of yourself and never give up. See you in a week with more stories about music on the Longplay channel. All the best. See you soon. Bye-bye.